anyone who's familiar with my work will know that I'm not the uh, um, the fondest of Christianity. I have my criticisms, but um, even so, I still enjoy um, listening to Christian radio sometimes. And um, my favorite part of church when I attended was always the sermon. the The music was always like kind of hit or miss. You know, I could get that elsewhere, really. Though it was the, it was the sermon. It was that intellectual dive into the text, into the substance of why we are all here together. That always, um, that always really spoke to me and and really um, got me uh, personally involved in what was going on at the church. Um, and uh, I have to say, after having uh, left the faith, I kind of miss it to some degree. I still listen to, um, you know, preachers and priests from time to time. Bishop Robert Barron is an old favorite. Um, but I thought I might be able to um, try my hand at replicating that uh, with Homer, uh, who, for those of you who don't know, I hold to be a, a superior uh, Bible for Western culture. So I have here with me some Glenn Levitt and the Odyssey. Now, normally the the Iliad is the is held to be the foundation of Western civilization. And there is a strong argument to be made that I haven't heard made, but perhaps I'll make it one day, um, that the Iliad is not just a foundation for Western Christian Western civilization, uh, but for Christianity specifically. Um, if you read Gregory Nash's book, The Ancient Greek Hero in 24 Hours, which is the most ironic title for a you know six or 700 page brick of a book you could imagine. It is not a 24 hour read, but, um, <laughs> uh, the thematic overlaps and the thematic anticipation of Christianity in ancient heroism, Greek heroism, specifically in the Iliad, is almost too perfect to be a coincidence. Um, obviously, as an unbeliever myself, my interpretation of this would be, um, you know, that the early Christian writers were very familiar with the pagan themes in the Iliad, probably more so than even modern classicists are today, and were able to build that into their scripture. Obviously, if you're a believer, your interpretation might be something very different. Um, if I were a Christian, I would be reading this as a sort of alternative Old Testament anticipating the same New Testament. Uh, I think you could make that case. But the Odyssey is different and uh, goes in a different direction than the Iliad relating to Christianity. Uh, and it has bits of wisdom that, nevertheless, I think Christians could, could learn from and could agree with uh, as well. And it seems particularly relevant on this election night where I am uh, alternately checking in on how things are going and beating myself for being so anxious and checking in uh, on that information. I don't know how everyone else is, is doing in that regard too. Are you succumbing to the anxiety or are you not? And so I thought I might try an extemporaneous um, reading of, of two passages from the Odyssey in conjunction. Um, one from book 12 where Odysseus is recounting the stories of his journeys to the Phaeacians, and he is speaking specifically about the sirens here, his passage through. And so he's been warned by this sorceress, Circe, that you'll be passing through these sirens, they'll sing these lovely songs, but don't go near them. Plug your ears, block them out of your consciousness. You know, don't listen to them. And so he does this. He slices off some beeswax, plugs the ears of his uh, shipmates, but for himself, he decides he won't plug his own ears because he wants to hear what they'll say. 
but he ties has his shipmates tie him to the mast so that he cannot act on what he hears. They bound me hand and foot in the tight ship, erect at the mast block, lashed by ropes to the mast, and rowed and churned the white caps stroke on stroke. We were just offshore, as far as a man's shout can carry, scudding close when the sirens sensed at once a ship was racing past and burst into their high, thrilling song. Come closer, famous Odysseus, Achaea's pride and glory. Moor your ship on our coast so you can hear our song. Never has any sailor passed our shores in his black craft until he has heard the honeyed voices pouring from our lips, and once he hears, to his heart's content, sails on a wiser man. We know all the pains that the Greeks and Trojans once endured on the spreading plain of Troy when the gods willed it so, all that comes to pass on the fertile earth. We know it all. So they sent their ravishing voices out across the air, and the heart inside me throbbed to listen longer. I signaled the crew with frowns to set me free. They flung themselves at the oars and rowed on harder, Paramedes and Eurylochus springing up at once to bind me faster with rope on chafing rope. But once we left the sirens fading in our wake, once we could hear their songs no more, their urgent call, my steadfast crew was quick to remove the wax I'd used to seal their ears, and loosed the bonds that lashed me. Now, I think what sticks out most to me, and this isn't an original observation of mine, I heard this in one of the um, Heroes X Office Hours talks um, with Professor Nosh and others. Uh, most people, when they think of the Odyssey, imagine that the sirens are luring Odysseus and his crew with a kind of subliminal sexuality. They are women singing songs. But what's actually happening is they're luring him with the, uh, the possibility of wisdom, a narrative interpretation of what went on at Troy. They're telling him his own story, or at least that's what they're promising. But what Cersei says is that this is a destructive distraction everything in the odyssey all of the uh, dangers he encounters are either explicitly or uh, metaphorically literally or figuratively threats to his focus threats to his remembrance of home and it's only when he loses that focus when he loses that memory of his true identity of who he is, that his nostos, that his return home, might be destroyed. And that is what happens to his comrades. And as it relates to this election and to this media that we're listening to on either side, you know, left or right, that is offering us a narrative not just a narrative interpretation of the events that we are more or less participating in or have participated in, but a promise to make us wiser, to give us predictive power. And, and not just that, but to, but with an imperative injunction that you must do this. It is your civic obligation to do this. The, the, the fate of the country rests on your shoulders that is what they say that is what they imply sometimes say more explicitly and it reminds me of i think the one of the most important moral passages of the odyssey to the degree that you can find moral passages in the odyssey and the key distinction between the odyssey and the iliad as far as morality is concerned and it comes from the very first page indeed the first lines where he says, um, I'll just read the full 12 lines because they're not that long. The first lines of the Odyssey. Sing to me of the man, Muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course once he had plundered the hollowed heights of Troy. Many cities of men he saw and learned their minds. Many pains he suffered, heartsick on the open sea. 
fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home, but he could not save them from disaster, hard as he strove. The recklessness of their own ways destroyed them all. The blind fools, they devoured the cattle of the sun, and the sun god wiped from sight the day of their return. Launch out on his story, mused daughter of Zeus. Start from where you will. Sing for our time, too. And the critical phrase there, of course, is that he could not save his comrades, hard as he strove. You know, it was not within his power to save them. Their own recklessness destroyed them. We cannot save our nation. We cannot save other people. And that doesn't mean that our nation or other people are doomed. That's, that's the heroic mindset at work. If I don't save them, they're screwed. If I don't save them, they can't make it. The weight of the world rests like some giant boulder on my atlas-like shoulders. That's how the hero sees things. And uh, the Homer does emphasize that Odysseus did try to save them. It was a vain attempt. Um, he he could not save them, and the and it's hard enough to save yourself. You know, it's it's challenging enough just to keep your own memory straight, as I am trying to do here in the face of great political temptations to my own attention, which is why I'm here. <laughs> and so, um, I think when we think about our own life trajectory of the things that make us successful or unsuccessful in our own, in, in pursuit of our own aims, in pursuit of returning to a uh, home or, or finding a new home or creating some new space for ourselves, some degree of success, some accomplishment in our own lives. You know, when we take a step back and think about how impactful politics is in in those pursuits i think everyone has to admit that the the degree of influence is not not just negligible but almost non-existent it it it, it is so marginal as to be almost non-existent you know there's always and and to whatever degree it does have an effect there are always options at your disposal in your individual life that are within your sphere of power to mitigate or even completely sidestep those, those effects. If you can keep focused. One of the um, specials that's been quite popular on Netflix recently has been um, The Social Dilemma, which was directed by or, or produced by Tristan Harris, a, a, a rare professional ethicist um, from Silicon Valley. Um, an excellent message tainted, I think, with some of the same tools of persuasion which it... Uh, decries and is concerned about the documentary is nevertheless it's worth watching I think but the, the the point of this documentary which describes how these social media companies through no malicious intent have found themselves in a position of manipulating our attention and changing changing our soul really for, for lack of a better term you know as as Heraclitus once said, we are what we repeatedly do. I, actually, that's the Aristotle quote. I'm sorry. Heraclitus was the one who said, um, you know, uh, the content of our thoughts determines our character. Day by day, we are what we do. You know, we, we 
choose who we become by what we think about because what we think about determines what we do. Well, these social media companies have gotten very, very good at determining what you think about, what I think about. And so I think it is a good spiritual, psychological, and emotional exercise to periodically step back and say, what is worth spending more time thinking about? You know, what is worth repeating? You know, anyone who's ever been to a gym understands the value of reps. You know, anyone who's ever done martial arts understands the neurological benefits of repetition. You program that muscle memory and suddenly the actions become subconscious. That's where martial arts really becomes valuable. Not in some conscious understanding of how to perform a maneuver. That's useless until it becomes programmed into your brain. And you can do it without thinking. What are we being programmed to do without thinking? You know, I... and and. We are being programmed to do things without thinking, whether that's commuting to work in the morning, whether you just do the same route every day and it becomes subconscious. Uh, you, know, you, We have no choice but to be programmed. Are we doing the programming or is someone else doing the programming? And to what end? You know, what are we remembering? What are we forgetting? And if the greatest risk to the things that truly matter, like home for Odysseus, are distractions like elections, then maybe the best thing to do is sometimes, in some circumstances, take some metaphorical beeswax and plug our ears and block out the distractions that would cause us to forget the things that really matter, that really do control the direction of our life and our success in the goals that we think matter, or even the ability to determine which goals matter. Because if we're not pursuing our own goals, there's a very good chance that we're pursuing someone else's goals.